Hey everybody, Laurel here, and today I'm going to be taking a look at Cisco Systems, which is my current employer. And right now we're looking at the Golden Gate Bridge, which is actually the inspiration for the Cisco logo. You can kind of see the similarity. Um, I came to Cisco kind of accidentally um, after working in global development. I took a job with a video conferencing startup. And six months later, Cisco announced they were acquiring us. Um, and so that meant I had to make financial decisions um, around Cisco's financials and this big tech conglomerate that I really had no understanding of. Um, so doing a deep dive of their financials is um, a useful practice to kind of help me out there. The question I'll be looking at is how Cisco's transitioning from um, their core line of business with routers and switches, which are on the decline, and they're moving into this software as a service market. And I don't have a sense of if they're really making the right decisions to make that transition successful. Looking at some Cisco history now, um, these are the two co-founders. This is Sandy Lerner and Len Bozick, and they were a married couple who worked at Stanford together and they couldn't email each other from different buildings on campus. So what they pioneered is using LAN, local area networks, uh, to connect these disparate computer systems. And they did that with a multi-protocol router system. And yes, that's a mouthful, but it's also how Cisco made their big bucks. Some brief company history here. Uh, they were founded in 1984. Six years later, they went public. And if we think about this is the time that a lot of Americans were first getting online, uh, this is really kind of boom years for Cisco. They're making a lot of money uh, with Cisco routers connecting people to the internet. So by the year 2000, they were actually the most valuable company in the world with a 500 billion market capitalization. Um, and that burst with the dot-com bubble. And in the years since that, they tried to pivot towards more of a consumer-friendly focus uh, which didn't totally pan out. So right now they've kind of backed off of that. And we're seeing um, a lot of acquisitions and layoffs as they try to transition from being product oriented to focusing more on services. Uh, as far as their competitors go, this is just a handful. Uh, Cisco has their hands in so many different technology areas that this slide, uh, we could spend the whole presentation talking about competitors. So I'll just focus on a handful. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have those that compete in collaboration and unified communication. So that's Avaya, Microsoft, Polycom. And then um, you have things like Hewlett Packard, uh, that there's competition on networking products. And then IBM, um, there's actually, they collaborate on IoT area of business, but compete on data center servers. So let's take a look at what their financials show. Starting out with the income statement, uh, first and foremost is uh, revenue is down by quite a bit, by $1.25 billion, which is a lot. CEO Chuck Robbins attributes this to uh, the evolution of that business model, so moving away from products and more into services. And if we look at the line items here, we can see um, you know, product revenue on the decline with really a significant drop in the past year. Meanwhile, services are pretty steadily increasing. So it makes sense that that's their focus. Um, we also see a decline in COGS, R&D, and SG&A. And that's largely due to uh, our, the layoffs last year of around 6,000 people. Um, it's pretty interesting that they also highlight their R&D, since we know from Marty's class that there are some ways that companies can hide that information. But essentially, Cisco is saying, hey, look at us. We're spending $6 billion on R&D. So they really want people to know that. Looking a little closer at their margins, um, we can see overall Cisco has pretty healthy margins, 63% compared to an industry average of 47 and they're clearly watching this closely because they've improved it just a tick since last year. And if we isolate products um, and their margins, we can see um, there's been some, some increase, but they actually decreased their margins from last year slightly. 
versus services have been on a steadier increase and they're higher than the, the product margin. So it makes sense that Cisco is focusing more on the services. Taking a look at the balance sheet now, there's a couple interesting things going on here. Um, they increased their cash on hand by quite a bit, by $4 billion, um, by taking on more debt. And then they've been reducing PP&E. So Cisco has a lot of these huge campuses and, and physical buildings that they're reducing and selling off. And then they're on this acquisition kind of uh, shopping spree. And see, so we see here Goodwill is really high. And that's the result of them paying more than market price to do these acquisitions, which we'll get into a little bit later with some of the uh, their ratios. Taking a look at their current ratio, uh, this is taking current assets and dividing them by current liabilities. And this shows us the ability for a company to pay back liabilities with their assets. So it gives a rough estimate of financial health. In Cisco's case, they have three times the amount of cash on hand than liabilities. And that's 50% more than the industry standard around two. So they're in pretty good shape, but you could also argue that they shouldn't be holding on to this much cash, that they should be putting it back into a more productive use. Looking now at total asset turnover, um, this takes gross revenue and divides it by total assets. And it measures how efficiently a company is using their assets to generate sales. Basically, we want this number to be closer to one. The higher the number, the more efficient the company is operating at. So Cisco is lower than the industry average. We're at uh, 0.37 compared to the industry average of 0.48. And this is where things like that goodwill line item come into play. Because basically, this is telling us that Cisco has too many unproductive assets for the amount of sales that they're generating. Looking now at return on assets or ROI, uh, we're taking net income and dividing it by total assets. And this uh, shows us the profitability relative to total assets. Essentially, how efficient is management at using assets to generate earnings? And Cisco is actually stronger than the industry average here. They're at 7.4% uh, compared to 6.23 for the industry average. Uh, but you have to remember, they've also been reducing some of their assets, like those reductions in PP&E, and that helps boost up this number. Looking now at cash flow, just really quickly, uh, the most important thing, or one of the most important things here, is that they're generating more cash from um, their activities than from product sales. So essentially, they're running a profitable side business buying and selling companies. Um, they're also offering credit to clients in financing receivables. And then um, they're also giving a lot of money back, 5.5 billion back in terms of dividends, which is pretty high. And taking a look at CSR, um, Cisco does pretty good in terms of CSR. They produce an annual report that's 100 and pages, 180 pages long. So it's really robust. It's very formalized. Um, they have kind of policies around um, matching donations and volunteering and because of their size that really has an impact. So they've had uh, 12 million dollars in employee match donations and 200,000 volunteer hours from employees. Um, Cisco also lends technical expertise to disaster relief organizations and global development organizations which I thought was pretty cool. One area that I think Cisco can do better is around diversity and inclusion. Um, just looking at the percentage of female workers, um, Cisco does pretty well on their board, the board of executives, um, but is less impressive across the board. And keep in mind, they have 73,000 employees worldwide. So the fact that only a quarter of them are female is uh, it's not doing so great. I compared them here to Apple because Apple produces both hardware and software, and it's an interesting comparison. And you can see even Apple is doing... Um, you know, solidly better across the board than Cisco. But um, Slack is a really interesting comparison. Um, they're younger startup, um, largely software, but they've also been very vocal and public about um, intentionally creating a more inclusive workplace. So we see their numbers just being dramatically higher, 44% for overall workforce, 
the technical workforce numbers are really interesting here. Slack has twice the number of uh, female workers in, in a technical expertise than Cisco does, and that's really impressive. Management is also doing super well here. They're almost at 50%, 48%. And uh, while their board is slightly less diverse than Cisco, um, they're just really killing it across the board. So um, I thought this was pretty impressive. As far as um, some of Cisco's challenges going forward, I see it falling into um, two different categories. One is this classic innovator's dilemma. Essentially, can Cisco diversify new revenue streams without disrupting the existing ones that are keeping the lights on today? And a lot of their business is on-premise devices, and a lot of organizations are transitioning to the cloud, and they don't yet want to buy subscription models. They've previously bought products outright, and they don't want to have to keep paying for them. So um, that's going to be a struggle for Cisco as well. Um, at this time, they're taking these short-term gains, like putting dividends back out to shareholders instead of investing that money back into the company at a time that they really need to be making major changes. So that gets us into um, Cisco's ability to innovate and stay agile. It's really difficult to steer a big ship. Um, using Slack as the comparison again, uh, Slack was launched at the same time as Cisco Spark, um, a competitive product. And Slack has 6 million daily active users, which is a key measurement of software success. Um, Cisco Spark, we can't publicly disclose the numbers, but you can gather something from the fact that there are no publicly disclosed numbers out there. Um, so again, this is a fast moving industry and can, can they move things around to respond in time? And for opportunities, um, you know, they're, they're really immense. With things like IoT, um, all these connected devices coming on board, I, you know, connected cars, homes, wearables, implants, all of that brings more devices onto the network, which is good for the networking side of things, and they require a lot of security. So Cisco has networking and security lines of business, so they complement each other. Um, and there's also changes in the workplace that could really boost their collaboration business. So you have more people um, working remotely. A lot of millennials really want to work remotely. Uh, more consultants and contractors. So you see a rise in the use of things like video conferencing. Um, and then that also supports the um, networking business. So to wrap things up, um, my analysis is there are definitely challenges ahead for Cisco, but incredible opportunities. I would personally like to see more commitment from leadership on that regard. Um, so decrease the dividends and invest more back into the company's ability to make this transition. And also th see things like taking a firmer, more vocal stance on things like diversity and inclusion in the tech world instead of your typical corporate response. So that is it for my presentation. Thanks for following along. Here are some resources and references. And um, yeah, have a great end of the semester.